Kids, you can head on downstairs if you're doing Sunday school. Thank you for worshiping with us. How's everyone doing? Good. So hopefully you don't have to be in the church environment very long or you don't have to be in other Christian environments very long before you hear someone say the phrase, the gospel message. The gospel message is the good news of Christ. It's the announcement that there is forgiveness through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And it says that we can have peace with God, we can receive His mercy, His grace, by faith in Christ alone. In a nutshell, the gospel message tells us that God made all things and that He is making us new and regenerated because of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that truth should be proclaimed by Christians often. However, what do we tell someone when they've clearly set their hope in Jesus Christ And then life gets harder for them. What do we do when we see that they have surrendered their life to God? They've made the decision to turn and go God's way, stepping out in faith. And then things seem to start just getting worse. You know, at times, grief and pain and sorrow seems to pile on top of more grief and pain. And sorrow. What do we tell them when one month of financial troubles turn into 12 months with no end in sight? What do we tell someone when the trauma of a death of a family member or friend is followed by another death? What do we tell someone when a cancer diagnosis comes back or some other? Diagnosis comes back and health starts to fail. What do we tell someone when an addiction or some type of self-medicating is rearing its ugly head again even though they swore they'd never be back in that place ever again? What do we tell them when they've believed that redemption has come in the name of Jesus but their life still feels like it's in shambles? For that matter, for being honest, what do we tell ourselves? When things get more complicated, more difficult, instead of easier, it can be hard to believe, it can be hard to continue to have faith. When we set our hope in Jesus and things seem to go from bad to worse, how are we supposed to think and feel and act? Now, ancient Israel found themselves dealing with these same questions that I just asked. Moses found himself wondering the same thing. If God's really working, why are things getting worse now? If God really came to save us, then why did He let His people be given this seemingly impossible situation, this impossible task here in the desert? Moses asked God, Why? Why? And we too often ask God, why? Now the good news is that Almighty God is big enough to let us ask the why questions. No matter what our circumstances may be, no matter how much we doubt or even question or not whether God is really working on our behalf, if He's really on the move, the truth is that He is. He is working, and He is moving. And the doubts and fears of His people don't stop His work. And one day, soon, we'll see that. We'll see that completed truth. And that's the message we're going to hit on today. So I want to invite you to turn 
to Exodus chapters 5 and 6. We're going to be studying two chapters today, Exodus 5 and 6. So as you're turning there and getting set up, let me, let me set the stage for you a little bit. This is the first official meeting between Moses and Pharaoh, and we're going to focus on three main things here. Number one, we're going to focus on the lie that says God is not working. Number two, we're going to focus on the truth of God's holy word. And finally, number three, we're going to focus on the hope that we can have even when life is difficult. We can have confidence in God, even though He will allow us to suffer just like Israel. So let's begin here. Exodus 5, starting with verse 1. Here's what it says. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. So Moses, he says and he acts exactly how God instructed him to. And what do we see here? It doesn't work. It seems to fall on deaf ears. And not only that, but it seems to make the situation much worse now. So let's read Pharaoh's response in verse 2. Here's how Pharaoh responded. Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. So when Pharaoh said, I don't know the Lord, he was right. He didn't know God. He didn't recognize God as being the only real God of the universe. Because remember, after all, Pharaoh considered himself a God. The Egyptian people worshipped him as a God. Think about this. When we don't know the Lord, why would we obey him? So the ultimate issue is the same for us as it was for Pharaoh. Here's the main issue. Who is running the show here on earth? Who's the head honcho in charge here on earth? And Pharaoh is soon going to find out the hard way, the answer. But in the meantime, here's what Pharaoh does. He accuses the Jews of trying to trick him into letting them go. And then he orders all the foremen to stop supplying straw for the bricks that the Israelites were making. So think of this situation now. The Jews not only have to make an unreasonable amount of bricks every day, but now they were forced to go out and forage for the straw to make the bricks properly. And Pharaoh did not lower the quota of how many bricks were to be made. So the situation has gone from bad to worse. Moses is obeying. He's doing the right thing. And now the situation seems to just be imploding into itself. Moses did exactly what he was told to do. He and Aaron talked to Pharaoh. And it just blows up in their face. That's humiliating enough. But now, all the Jews are suffering even more. Let's jump to verse 19 now. Exodus 5, verse 19. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble now because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. And when they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron And they were waiting for them. And they said to Moses and Aaron, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. For you have made us odious or putrid. They stink in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. 
So all the Israelites are believing the lie that God is not working at all on their behalf. And we can almost hear this unbelief in their hearts. It's undoing the strong belief that they had when Moses first arrived. And their faith just crumbles immediately. And as a result, they believe the lie that said they they were not going to be saved by God. They couldn't be saved by God in this situation. Today they're making bricks without straw. And the next day, guess what? Bricks without straw. And the day after that, more bricks. And then they would just probably be dead. That's where they're at right now. And we see Moses isn't immune to this either. He has some doubts as well. But I want us to notice how Moses handles this a bit different than the rest of the Israelites. The people turn against Moses in their unbelief. But we see Moses turns to the Lord. He turns his questions, his honest questions to the Lord. And we can even hear groaning in his voice. He's speaking now in verse 22. Moses' is groaning, though, is actually going in the correct direction. So let's look at verse 22. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? And why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to the people. And you have not delivered your people at all. So we can learn a lot from Moses' response here. So when questions about today come, and when fears about tomorrow creep into our mind, when doubts about God's promises come at us, what do we do? What do we do? Well, the correct answer is we take our questions to God. We take our questions to His Holy Word. And you know what? We might be groaning while we're doing that. But we take that groaning to the Lord. What is it that makes us sometimes believe the lie that says God is not working in this world to rescue his people. What is it? What circumstances are we facing that seem to confirm the lie is actually truth? Maybe it's all these crazy natural disasters that seem to be ramping up. Even more in these last few years and months and weeks. Maybe it's the constant threat of wars or threats against our religious freedom, even in our own country. Maybe it's watching the news and reading about how Hamas brutally attacked Israel during a major holiday, no less, and killing over a thousand men and women and children. And that number just keeps rising daily. Maybe it's an ongoing struggle with a secret sin that we're having. Or maybe it's a broken, painful relationship or a grief or a trauma that keeps getting stirred up. All these things and more can make us question the Word of God that says He is definitely making all things new through Christ. All these things combined can make us feel as if the Gospel message isn't true. Because if it was true, Things wouldn't be this way, right? Let's remember something. Suffering and salvation go hand in hand. Suffering and salvation, they're not strangers to each other. In God's work of redemption, in His work of renewal, He does allow us as His people to be squeezed, to be stretched, to be refined. 
God allows his people to make bricks without straw. And God allows this because it forces us then to face those parts of ourselves that we would sometimes rather not. That we would try to otherwise ignore and push to the side. Kind of like the blind spots that Pastor Dan was talking about in last week's message. God can and he will use suffering to develop us into better people. People who can love and who can enjoy him not only on this earth, but for all eternity. So we can bring our suffering to Him. We should bring our suffering to Him. We can bring our groaning to Him. Telling Him of our fears and our doubts and our struggles. He wants to hear. And then, we need to listen to Him because the only thing that can defeat a filthy lie is the truth that comes from God. And this truth is what God hammers into Moses again and again and again. God keeps giving Moses the truth over and over again. So that's the second thing we're going to focus on in this message. The truth that God speaks to Moses. God tells Moses the truth, and God's truth can undo any lie that the enemy tries to speak into our life. So before we get into details on that here, I want to quickly point out what God does when Moses groans and listens. Or maybe a better way to say that is I want to point out what God does not do to Moses. God does not berate Moses over this. He doesn't ridicule Moses over this. He doesn't shame Moses for coming with these groaning questions. And throughout the biblical story, this is how God constantly deals with His people when we come asking honest questions, struggling to believe Him when the circumstances would otherwise lead us to go astray. God is gentle with us when we do that. He is big enough to handle our doubts, and our fears. We hear this all throughout the book of Psalms. We hear it all throughout the gospel accounts with Jesus. Notice though, to the arrogant people, to the proud people, the ones who ask questions to try to trip Jesus up or try to trap him, he's severe with them and he doesn't hold back. But God is always gentle with the struggler who asks and listens and trusts him like a child, it admits that they don't have all the answers. So let's read about this now. Exodus 6, starting with verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go. Under compulsion, he will drive them out of his land. Verse 3, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established by covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel, Because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. I have remembered my covenant. Verse 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from the bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give it to you as a possession. 
I am the Lord. So do we see how Moses, I'm sorry, God takes Moses back to that covenant relationship that he established with the forefathers of our faith. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God takes Moses back to the promises he made with them all those years before, and then God reaffirms his intentions toward his people now. Notice all the I statements in there. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. I'll bring you into the land. I will give it to you as a possession. So God just keeps hammering, countering the lies of Pharaoh. Countering those fears of Israel. And he says, not only will your lives be spared, but I will give you myself to repay you for all that suffering. That's the kind of God the Israelites served. That's the kind of God we serve. Despite appearances, despite what circumstances look like in your life in this world, God is still moving. God is on the move. So now Moses speaks all these truths back to the people again. And you know what happens? They choose not to hear the truth again. The people couldn't believe anything but the lie at that moment. It was just too impossible for them to see anything different and hear anything different. Think about it. 400 years of slavery and now this impossible task was right in front of them. The lie seemed to be too strong. The circumstances seemed to be too dark. And the people couldn't see how the truth could be the truth. So that brings us to our last point. The last point in this message is hope. What's the hope we can truly have when it's hard to believe? So let's look at Exodus 6, verses 10 through 13 now. Verses 10 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to tell the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So clearly Moses is still struggling. His words to God express his weakness, his feelings of inadequacy. And God also sees the unbelief of his people. They didn't trust him fully. They were believing the lie instead of the truth. And they were continuing just to listen to the circumstances instead of listening to His promises. So now, even though all this was going on with Moses and the people, notice how God does not stop saving them. In fact, He sends Moses right back at them giving them a charge to bring his people out of Egypt and to bring them into a new life with God. And that right there is the God we serve in the Bible because God is the one who saves people who are weak. God is the one who saves people who are faltering in their faith. God is the reason that we can still have hope even when we can't see how it's all going to be played out. We don't have, listen to this, we don't have hope because maybe the suffering is going to end. Guess what? The suffering may not end. 
We don't have hope because maybe things are going to get better. Things may not get better. But we have hope because we have a faithful God who promises to save us to Himself. That can't be stopped. That's not going to ever get altered. The God who committed Himself to redeem His people in Jesus Christ and make all things new, that will happen. That is happening right now. And He gives us the gift of faith so that we may hear the truth of Jesus and really believe it and hold on to it. Even though our faith may be small, even though our faith may be puny and weak, as we hear these lies again and again in this world, and sometimes the circumstances support the lies, don't they? I don't know about you, but my faith can feel very small and puny and ineffective when I feel like I'm in a situation where I'm making bricks without straw. But you know what? It's not my faith that saves me. It's not your faith that saves you. It's not about how pure your faith is, how strong you think your faith is, how disciplined, how many years you've had of faith. I want to repeat that. Our faith does not save us. Jesus saves us. Christ saves us. One of my favorite stories is in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. So Jesus meets a father whose son is demon-possessed. And this demon had tried to destroy his son by throwing him into the fire to get burned and throwing him into the water to be drowned. And we can see in this story that the father of this boy has a hard time believing that the son could be set free from this affliction because he's had it ever since he's been a little child. So his whole life the son has had this. But we also see that even though the father is struggling here with doubt, he knows that he has to talk to Jesus about it. He groans to Jesus about it. And here's what the father said to Jesus. If, if you can do anything, please take pity on us and help us. And Jesus heard the Father, and here's how Jesus replied. If, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately, the boy's father then cried out and said, I do believe, Lord, help my unbelief. That's a lot of weakness that the Father is admitting here, isn't it? That's a lot of doubt that the Father is expressing. That's a lot of transparency. That's honesty in the heart of this Father that He's crying out. And we see the Father groaning for His Son because He can't really see how things are going to be different. But He also knows that Jesus can make this right if He wills it. And we see here in this story, Jesus wills it. Jesus sends the demon away from the boy. Here's what he says. I command you to come out of him and do not ever enter him again. Now, it's, it's not done yet. The demon leaves the boy and the boy is lying there like a corpse. And everyone around there that witnessed this thought the boy was dead. He's laying motionless. So Jesus rescued the boy, but was this ordeal now too much for the boy to exercise this demon out of him? Was he dead now because of all the years that this demon had inflicted the little boy? And this got me thinking about this. I wonder what the father was thinking at that moment. 
He's seeing his boy lifeless, unresponsive, on the ground. I wonder if in that brief moment, he might have regretted asking Jesus for help. Did the father regret trusting and believing in Jesus? I don't know the answer. But we do know what Jesus proceeds to do. Jesus took the boy by the hand, raised him up, and the boy got up. So, I want everyone to listen real closely. When Jesus calls us, when he begins to do a renewing in our life, a redemption in our life, things may often go from initial hope to dark doubt. When we surrender ourselves to the call of Christ in our life, sometimes all hell can break loose. The enemy can start to war at us like never before it feels. The wages, the consequences of sin can seem to get bigger, not smaller. When someone humbles themselves to Jesus, life can get harder, not easier. We have to remember that. So back to the very beginning now. What can we tell a brother or sister in Christ who is struggling with this? They're going through trials that seem to be now on a much bigger scale. What can we tell them? What do we say to our own soul when we're we're, we're feeling like we're making bricks without any straw? I think we tell people that they're not alone. We tell ourselves that we are not alone. Tell them and tell yourself that this isn't some strange, crazy thing happening. Tell them and tell yourself to take the heartache, to take the suffering, to take the doubt, to take the groaning in the correct direction. That direction is towards God. Take it to God. And then remember that we have a faithful God. We have a truthful, promise-making God. Remember and go back to the truth of the Gospel message. Here's the truth of that. Christ came down. He lived. He taught. He walked among us. Christ was then accused tortured he was sacrificed for us christ was killed buried and then raised from the dead for us and christ will come back again and when christ comes back again sooner than later he will once and for all complete the story by making things totally new So don't believe the lie. Believe and have hope and faith. Believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you for Exodus 5 and 6 here, especially with what's going on in this world right now. Lord, what happened all those years and years and years ago, it's not just some story we can read about. This is applicable 100% right now, Lord, in our own lives personally and in the greater world. Lord, let us hold on. Lord, when things seem to get darker, let us hold on. Lord, when we can't see a way out of something, what someone is going through or what we ourselves are going through, maybe we've been praying about something 
for months and years, even decades, and we don't see a change. Lord, let us hold on to you. Let us go back to your promises. And Lord, we don't have to pretend. We can take, Lord, our questions to you. Let us humbly take our groanings to you on this, Lord Jesus. That's the relationship that you've granted us to have with you. But Lord, I pray that we look to your word. Lord, we look to other people, Lord, that are following you. And we find our hope, Lord, in what you say. Lord, thank you for our families, our brothers and sisters in Christ that could come alongside us during these hard times and can, Lord, speak your word, point us to you, and Lord, just hold us as we are groaning at times. May we not take that for granted. May we not isolate on that. Let us be transparent, Lord, just as Moses was, just as his father was, Lord, in the story. Lord, thank you for working in us. And Lord, may we just continue to dive deeper into your word, especially in these stories, Lord, about Moses and the Israelites. Lord, it is so applicable for today and what's, Lord, in our future. We thank you, Lord. We love you and it's in Christ's name we pray.